Hey everyone, Clint Butler here, and on behalf of Mission Canine Rescue, Bob Bryant, Tony Villalobos, and others involved in the organization, I'd like to thank you very much for coming in and joining us. We don't get to do this very often with nonprofit organizations, and especially Mission Canine, because they're so busy doing all kinds of other stuff. And on top of that, they actually all have normal real lives. So you get to see uh, or hear about what they're doing uh, on Facebook and in their post or on their on their site, but you don't get to really get the chance to ask questions of the people behind uh, the scenes. Now, originally we were expecting to have Tony Villalobos here with us as well. Uh, if you don't know Tony, he is actually, I don't know, the kennel guy. He takes care of the dogs. He donates his time doing that. I think he's getting, he's paid now too, right? Uh, if I'm not correct or incorrect, but he holds a position over there. Um, but right now, he, like we were talking about earlier in the uh, pre-show, Tony's actually getting receiving dogs in Houston that are coming from the ladies out of Kuwait and, and uh, you know, transporting those to the, the permanent kennels and also to the vet. So we'll, we'll miss out on Tony, but we got Brian, Bob here. Bob Bryant, he's co-founder and chief financial officer for Mission Canine Rescue. Welcome, Bob. Welcome, Thank you. yeah, the king of nothing. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> I said, don't forget, I'm also the king of nothing. <laughs> the king of nothing. Well, you just recently like gave up your whole corporate job thing, and you're you know running around playing golf and doing all kinds of stuff now, aren't you? <laughs> no, I, I just got, I was riding three horses, I got off one, two's plenty. <laughs> awesome. Well, Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, All right. Uh, I'm Bob Bryant. I currently reside in Newbury Park, California. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potential corporate connections and also a lot of uh, military and contract working dog uh, connections out here in the Los Angeles area. And it's to Mission Canine's benefit for me to be here. Uh, personally, I work in financial services. That's what provides uh, my income. I work in credit card processing. I became involved in the working dog world totally by accident uh, back in 2011 when I was searching through large Facebook groups and found the predecessor of what now has become our organization and put out an offer to the people that were running it where if they would share some posts, I would share revenue. They liked the idea and uh, met them at the, uh, some an award show here in Beverly Hills back in 2011 and fell in love with the mission. And the, the rest is history. Uh, my day is spent with uh, dealing with social media. Uh, if you ever get angry because uh, somebody doesn't do something you don't like on the Facebook page, uh, I'm the one you can yell at. Uh, I'm the guy that's responsible for all that. Uh, I schedule our posts, I deal with our uh, paid advertising, I deal with anything related to donations, grants, uh, income to the organization, and it's my responsibility to see that we spend the money wisely. And as a result of that, and not through any thing that I do personally, but just because we're very frugal, a lot of organizations claim to give 100% of all donations to the work. And candidly, it's just not true. There's always overhead that's figured in there. Some organizations take a management fee and they don't disclose it, yet they claim to give 100%. So when I tell you that Mission Canine Rescue gives 91% of the donations we receive toward the mission, it's true and our Form 990 proves it out. We run a very tight ship, we don't waste money, and we try to do the best we can with our donors' funds. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very rare and it's very, that is a timely question considering, you know, the stuff that the Red Cross is going through right now as a result of the Houston and Florida, you know, they, you know, people are saying don't donate to them because they're not using all the money. Well, you know, it takes money to make money and they have to make money to provide the stuff that they're doing. So it's, it's good to actually get that out of the, out in the open uh, versus ha waiting for someone to ask it if that makes sense. Right. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the co-founders. Obviously, they couldn't be here, but how did you three, you know, who are they and how did you three get hooked up together? Well, we, we got hooked up as a result of that event that I just mentioned in Beverly Hills uh, when I met, uh, went there, uh, being just me, Mr. Average Businessman that had an idea that was going to make some money 
and help somebody in the process. I didn't know them. I met uh, Louisa Kastner and Kristen Maurer. And uh, a year later, Kristen and I uh, decided to co-found uh, Mission Canine along with Louisa. And we got our start back in late 2011. And I, when I met them here in Southern California, and there's a real good synergy between our team. Uh, not only are we partners and we manage this organization, we're all good friends. And although we fuss and we squabble like anybody else, uh, we always uh, come back together and we always do what's right uh, for our organization. And we try to help each other out whenever possible. That's awesome. Uh, I wanted to uh, highlight Tony for some of the work that him and as I understand it, it was a couple more people that went with him to Houston and they were helping, uh, you know, secure animals from during the flooding kind of in the um, big. Yes, yes. actually that, that was a gentleman named Ron who is a certified uh, fast water rescue expert uh, from Southern California. Uh, Tony, who I believe is FEMA certified as well as having uh extensive canine handler experience uh, in Afghanistan and of course managing all our dogs, plus Kristen, uh, who is uh, very well qualified to handle canines. Louisa is a veterinary technician. She's retired United States Army. Uh, she served uh, with, uh, with dignity and with honor and she took care of animals while she was in the military and then again afterwards. Uh, during the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, it became evident that organizations weren't getting to all the areas that they needed to as fast enough. And uh, Kristen made the decision personally to assemble a team of experts that could get into these areas, rapidly deploy. And as a result, uh, we saved a number of animals, a couple of horses, I think even some chickens, believe it or not. And uh, it, was, it was good to get in and help the community. One thing that, that I saw from a distance, and I want to make it clear that I did not have the opportunity to be there. There was literally no way I could get into Houston at the time. I've been there since then, and frankly, you can't really tell that there's that there ever was a problem, but certainly there was, and uh, the areas that we saw faced a lot of, I say that we saw, my partner saw faced a lot of devastation, and we were happy to get in, and a lot of our supporters actually donated toward that rescue effort, even though it didn't have anything to do with working dogs. And we were very, very impressed with that. Yeah, I, you know, Tony actually did that live stream when he was in there. It was probably the midway through that trip. And it was pretty, I've worked with Tony. I worked with him in Afghanistan. I don't know if anyone knows, but I was his kennel master in Afghanistan uh, and a trainer. And it's, you know, knowing that big guy and the emotion that came out of that video, uh, I can I can imagine that it was both disheartening and really satisfying being able to help out there. Yes, it was. And actually, Tony told me that you washed the dishes there, but uh, that's another conversation. Well, I did those too, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that kind of leads us off into mission, the mission canine rescue. And you guys kind of have this five point mantra, rescue, reunite, rehome, repair, and rehabilitate. And to carry that off, and you guys aren't doing it yourselves. And this is the second part of this is I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of, I know you say thank you to the veterinarians that help you out or give shout outs to people that are doing fundraisers, but let's go with the rescue and, and repair and rehabilitate. Who are, who are the vets that are helping you? Um, I won't say the most, but are helping you significantly in taking care of these dogs. And, and in, in, in Houston, Texas, predominantly uh, Memorial uh, Veterinary Clinic uh, is, is an excellent facility. They've treated a number of our dogs. Uh, second to that, uh, and really second to none, both of these veterinarians are top notch, is Dr. Skip Fix down at Nottingham Veterinary Clinic on Memorial Drive in Houston. Also, Dr. Dietz. Uh, down in uh, Richmond, Texas. Uh, we do some work with Red Bank uh, Veterinary Clinic up in New Jersey through our partnership as a member of the United States War Dogs Association serving as Chapter uh, 6, their transportation arm. Red Bank steps up for our dogs. Uh, I have numerous uh, contacts here in the Los Angeles area, Dr. Lena Yedeshevsky, Dr. Wise Veterinary Clinic in uh, 
Thousand Oaks, California, Advanced Veterinary Specialist in Santa Barbara, California, specifically Dr. Rodney Ale, who's an incredible veterinary oncologist. He's taking care of military working dog Oreos, uh, very rare cancer uh, at this time. And as a result, uh, Oreos still acting like a young dog. And we can't say enough for the people that, that help us. And certainly I've probably forgotten somebody, uh, Sunset Veterinary Clinic comes to mind. Uh, they were there when military working dog Nora passed away suddenly last summer. They provided uh, comfort, care, and concern. Uh, they even enrolled her in a, in a special uh, study. And occasionally Texas A&M uh, helps us out as well. They have an, a, an incredible facility for advanced veterinary medicine research. That's in College Station, Texas. Yeah, we did some connection work with them with AMK9 for a little bit too. That's was pretty good. Right. You also have... Beyond your individual donors, there's businesses that are collecting or going out of their way and holding fundraisers for you. One that comes to mind is I believe there's a pet store in the Houston area. They just they raised I think was it twenty five thousand uh, dollars at a fundraiser that they put on for you guys. Well, actually, it's it, it, it's not a pet store. Uh, it's a Rover Oaks uh, Kennel and Pet Resort. They have they have locations in Katy, Texas, and locations in Houston, Texas. Uh, Rover Oaks is a first-class facility. They have doggy daycare. They have a waiting pool. Uh, they actually treat those animals, uh, I see animals, they treat your pets like pure gold. And uh, we can't say enough about them. There's also Metal Lake Pet Resort out in Pearland, Texas. Uh, also, uh, Heather Ratinsky with the Dutch Shepherd Army uh, up in uh, Colorado with Chuck and Don's Pet Supplies. Uh, they raise money for us. Uh, Hogwarts Running Club. Uh, they have people running r running for the dogs. We've already received uh, a check worth several thousand dollars from them. And there's so many other private donors that help us do what we do. And a lot of what the callers, callers, you think I'm on a radio show, I'm old. <laughs> um, all the callers call in now. Uh, <laughs> One thing I want everybody to know is that we're not a little organization anymore. A, a lot of times when we come out and we, we have a fundraiser and we say we need $40,000 to bring this group of dog home, sometimes people's eyes roll back in their heads. Well, why? Well, what people don't realize is that we'll do over a million dollars in funding this year toward our work. And we've doubled our work every year, and that's why it's more critical for us to seek out the corporate donors, the uh, companies with the ability to, to give more than, than you or I. But if it wasn't for the individuals on this webinar who constantly give over and over and over and over, we'd never get where we are now, and we're always going to have a need. It's the nature of a nonprofit to do this. Because without your funding, we can't do the work that you've indicated that you wanted us to do. So uh, that's it. Clint, I, I don't know. Uh, you're, you, you've got a track you, you, you're running on, but I know a lot of people want to talk about, you know, is the military bringing dogs home? Why do these laws, laws not attract, uh, you know, apply to contract dogs? Get that in somewhere, but I'm going to shut up. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get that one uh, last. Uh, actually, kind of that's an actually good transition for us. Is you had me, I was running your AdWords campaigns for you, and you, we had this big push for the Kuwaiti dogs. That's how I refer to them now as the Kuwaiti dogs. And this pack, is, uh, as, I, as I understood, it was 17, and now you just bumped it up to 21 with three other dogs from another contracting company and then the one rescue. How... How do you, are you? How are they? These organizations finding you, or are you reaching out to them to know, notify them that you're available to take the dogs in, or you know, you know, how how does that? We that actually, I can I can answer that succinctly. Uh, at, at this point, people know who we are, and they know what we do. They know we've been recognized as walking the walk, and actually doing what we say we do and doing it at a reasonable cost. We're not one of these fly-by-night organizations that uh, makes a dog suffer through surgery five times so that we can pat our pockets and make an income. Uh, that's not what we're about at all. Uh, 
Okay, I just lost my train of thought. Give me that question. Real, real, you see, I'll admit it. I forget stuff. Go, go through it again. Let me finish what I'm answering. That's why I got notes right here. So. <laughs> well, I got notes. It, I don't. Like, how does a contracting company in Kuwait find Mission King? Wow. Okay, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Tune the ears back in. Okay. Uh, they know who we are. We're known worldwide now. When people want to retire their working dogs, they reach out to us. When people know of a bad situation with working dogs, they reach out to us. We also have contacts with all of the larger working dog companies, the military, uh, AM Canine or their new Vaporwake uh, takeoff company, Elite Canine uh, in LRB, North Carolina, uh, Von Lick Kennels, uh, Mike Ritland's crew, uh, K2 also, who K2 Solutions, which is uh, also uh, a very quality working dog company. They did a lot of training for the TED program uh, back at, back back in the day. In fact, some of the dogs that we rescued from the uh, the debacle in the TED program were trained originally at uh, K2. But no, these organizations reach out to us now. We don't have to hunt for them. In fact, now we have more and more police departments that are reaching out to us. Uh, the first three years, we had maybe four police canines. Uh, in the last year, I think we've taken in 10 and we've got five, I believe five departments now wanting to retire their dogs where for whatever reason, the handler can't take their dog, either because they've got a small child or there's an, uh, another dog aggressive issue. You know, lots of reasons why a handler can't take a dog. And maybe we ought to cover that because some people get angry. Well, you also kind of lead into that. You recently brought in a dog where the adopters needed a help because they could no longer facilitate the care of that dog. So you guys took it in to rehome it later, uh, right? So that's like, correct. My handler and I adopt the dog, and like something happens versus me trying to find a you know a fly by night solution or pass it off. I can call Mission Canine and say, "Here, we please help me out." That's correct. If it's a, if it is a dog that has worked in some capacity and provided service or is a working breed with a moderate level of training, in most cases, we will be able to accept the dog. Awesome. How are you guys finding the, the handlers? Like I know Tony, he was asking me, it seemed like every other day if I knew handler for this dog, <laughs> but is there you guys have more direct methods of finding handlers for these? We have a lot of contacts uh, through our connections with, with the military, through the various uh, kennel networks that operate worldwide, uh, through the contract working dog companies, through groups on Facebook, through people like you who we call and say, hey, you know, do you know who this dog was? Um, that That's a better question for Tony and Louisa. But we have, uh, we, we've always got a, a way to go to try to do an exhaustive search to see if the dog had someone who knows him or her and, mm -hmm. and, and that, that could take him or maybe be close enough to where the former handler could at least visit the dog. That's awesome. Uh, I think we're doing good. I was going to talk about success stories with Tony, mainly because of the Houston stuff that you're going on. And he was, he's actually running that we're down at the kennels in Houston. Let's, let's talk about that kennels for a little bit. You guys, obviously you're bringing in dogs and you're relying on fosters. I'm assuming, uh, no. before him. No, 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 we were not relying on fosters. We were spending up to $24,000 a month at deeply discounted uh, boarding centers. Uh, Parkland Kennel in uh, Richmond, Texas, was our mainstay in our lifeline until we purchased our ranch. Uh, however, our vet, our kennel bills were approaching $22,000 a month and it just wasn't cost effective. It prevented us from growing. And while we didn't spend any more as far as percentage of donations than, don't, than, than we do now, we're now able to do more work because we basically cut our costs in half by having the ranch and having additional staff to run the ranch. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. And then um, let's talk about your uh, rehabilitative process because rehoming is obviously it's pretty simple. And there's another question from the audience on rehoming. So we'll close out with audience questions, but 
rehabilitation, you're talking, you do the surgeries or whatever. Let's say you have a dog with bad hips. How far are you guys getting into the weeds with these animals? Ooh, we've gotten in so deep. Uh, three, three dogs are famous triplets, Tiger, Aster, and Jack. All three Czech Shepherds. All three had severe hip dysplasia. All three required bilateral hip replacement surgery. And uh, to this day, we've still got some issues with, uh, I believe, Jack, who's rejected his hip ball transplant. Uh, those three dogs alone, uh, we spent close to $60,000 on to this point. And a lot of people say, why didn't you just put the dog down? I'll tell you why. Because those dogs saved lives. And to me, it's worth whatever it costs to let them have an opportunity to have a decent retirement because of their skills and what they were able to do, whether it's keeping uh, heroin and ecstasy and God knows what out of our ports or uh, stopping the flow of money laundering, uh, finding explosives, uh, just so many things, uh, apprehending bad guys. Uh, they're worth whatever it costs. And it's sad that there's not insurance coverage that gives these dogs the equivalent of our Medicaid, Medicare system. For sure. For sure. Okay, I'm going to... I should have just like you talking. <laughs> I put the uh, the donation link up to anyone who's in the, uh, the room and then wants to take the opportunity to donate. Um, oh, let me put out a shameless plug. Shameless plug time. <laughs> uh, also, if you have questions, you've always wanted to ask Bob about jujitsu, mission canine, or anything, uh, now is the time. <laughs> the, shame, the, the shameless plug is this. We raised about three quarters of the money we needed to do this transport. Yes, we went ahead, we brought we were over, we brought the dogs back. We had enough money to do that. What we don't have enough funding to do is the continued vet care, the cost at the ranch. That's that's where when we tell you it costs two thousand dollars to bring a dog home, we're not kidding. By the time we fly that we go there, we buy the health certificates, we provide the crates. Uh, yeah, we even save money by sending a crew over there, and you can see some of them. The dogs actually fly as excess baggage. Once they get back here, they still need vet care. Uh, you know, uh, per dog, it could run $500. You know, we have one in there now. It could run $2,000 just for the dog's veterinary care. So it's uh, difficult to know the exact cost. So whenever, whenever we ask, there is a legitimate need. We don't ever ask just to pat our pockets and while we like to be able to have a reserve, and that's what we're running on now, we don't want to have to say no the next time. Um, do you want to talk briefly about the laws and who's brought home and who's not, or do you want to just take questions? Yeah, let's do that and give them time to ask a couple more questions that we can have it loaded Okay. Up. Real quickly, everybody, everybody thinks the military is bringing all the dogs home now. You guys don't have to do that anymore. No, they're not. Yes, there was a law passed in December of 2015, uh, part of the National Defense Authorization Act, that guaranteed every military dog a free trip home. The military was to have submitted their plan to do that by March of 2016. To this day, because of how busy they are, because of the protocol change, it's not as simple as throwing a dog on a, a transport plane. There has to be some protocol associated with it. To this day, the military has not brought the first dog home at their expense. And when a handler needs his dog brought home, he reaches out to Mission K-9. At some point, the military will start transporting dogs. I know they will. They treat their dogs like absolute pure gold. No complaints whatsoever with the way the military dogs are treated. However, they're only going to return them back to where their last kennel was or their duty station in the United States. And if their handlers across the country, the handler's still got to get the dog there, so we're still going to need a little bit of help with transport. Contract working dogs, there is no law in the United States that applies to their return or their contracts. While most contractors do the right thing and return the dogs, some of them don't. 
And it's those contractors that while people want us to damn them, name names, go set their compound on fire, we take the high road. We go, we work with them, we negotiate to get the dogs out and we bring them home. And because of that, we've been successful where every other our organization that's tried to go in there, especially into Kuwait, has failed. So should there be a law regarding contract working dogs? Absolutely, positively, yes. But is there? No. And until there is, Mission K-9 is there to step up. And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> well, Deb, that kind of leads into Deb's question is, you know, why are these companies not bringing them back? And I think that runs into balance sheet and financial issues, right? Yeah, I was just going to bring out the main reason. <laughs> this is the reason. When a contractor loses a contract and suffers financially or has some other loss, the dogs are going to be the first ones that suffer. I don't know how well this group of dogs is being fed in Kuwait. What I've seen are the photos that, by the way, we're going to be posting a lot more photos. There's a new video up right now showing them leaving uh, the Kuwait airport last night. And a couple of them have already arrived in Houston. Um, okay. Get me back on track again here. The money. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, when, 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 when the contractors suffer financially, the dogs don't always get out. So we don't know what we're going to get, but we, but we work with them. And that's why uh, they don't just not bring them home. It's either mismanagement of funds or it's some drastic problem. And again, this is not the majority of contractors. Most of them bring their dogs home. This is just a handful of small ones that probably shouldn't have ever gotten into contracting in the first place. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I know from my experience with the A and K nine, those they did great. You know, the handlers went home before the dogs did, <laughs> but yeah. you know, we put every one of them dogs on a plane back home. So, oh, A and K nine treated their dogs magnificently. Also, K two and Elite K nine, they all do a great job. Well, let's get the questions from the the group. Uh, Kathy has one: Is do you have to be a handler to adopt the dogs? Absolutely, absolutely not. And let me cover our adoption parameters. First of all, there's not an unlimited pool of dogs. I wish there was. Uh, second, we match the dog to the family, not the family to the dog. It is not necessary that you be a handler, but it is necessary that you understand and know how to deal with large dogs, that you're not afraid of them, that you can physically manage them. And the main thing is that you can afford their cost of care until we find the ability to uh, provide insurance for the dogs. And, and that's something that I, I'm personally working on. And I hope within this calendar year to be able to offer something to, to our adopters. Uh, we have to make sure that the adopters can afford the cost of veterinary care because too many dogs get, oh, we're sorry, boy. We just can't afford that right now. And obviously we can't afford to maintain the cost for the hundreds of dogs that we've adopted out since 2012. Right, for sure. Uh, Christine's question is, what is the background of the typical background of the dogs that you rescue and who adopts these dogs generally? Typical background, they are, I would say, 65% contract working dogs, 35% military working dogs. Uh, they have either, uh, the contract dogs are, are single purpose, either having worked in uh, drugs are, or uh, explosives detection. We've had one dog that was a currency detection dog. Another one found electronics. In fact, uh, that's uh, uh, EDD, uh, electronics detection dog, also explosive detection dogs, but her name is Marley. And she found cell phones in prison. The military working dogs predominantly, and I can speak to uh, Oreo who uh, lives with me, Oreo was a, an explosives detection dog who worked off leash during the uh, Operation Freedom, uh, Iraqi, uh, pro, Iraq Operation Freedom program back in 2000, I believe 2006, 2007, and he worked off leash searching for IEDs. Other dogs uh, worked in Afghanistan. These are usually dual purpose dogs uh, uh, that will also do uh, patrol work, meaning bite work as well as either drugs or, or narcotics. And in addition, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Um, uh, they're mostly uh, predominantly Belgian Malinois is the uh, 
breed of choice, uh, followed by uh, Dutch Shepherds, followed by German Shepherds, uh, followed by Labrador Retrievers for uh, bomb work. But the Malinois are lighter. They don't eat as much as the labs. They run faster than the labs. Uh, they are basically, we call them the Velociraptor of the German Shepherd family. Mm -hmm. They're like German Shepherds on crack. Uh, everyone sees my dog, and I have a, a working dog. We both retired from the Army on the same day. She's a patrol uh, narcotic dog. And they ask us what she is, and I was like, it's a Belgian Malinois. I, was, I don't know. They don't know what that is. And I say, well, a German Shepherd needs a hero, so they call it Belgian Malinois. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Liz's question is, how many dogs do you got at the ranch? And do you work with other Ooh. organizations like Mal Malinois Rescue Ranch? Okay. okay. Uh, what, what, what was the second part of the question? Uh, you're working with other organizations, like there's a, the Malinois Rescue Ranch is the example. That she okay. Gave. okay. Uh, all right. To, to answer your question, <clears throat> currently at the ranch, we got way too many dogs. Uh, with all okay. these coming today, uh, we, ha we will have approximately 21 at the ranch. We will have another five that are in veterinary care. We have another six that will be going northeast to a new facility that we've just established to uh, have local staff there that might need to go up to Red Bank Veterinary Clinic. And there is potential for uh, a center here in Southern California in the near future. Uh, we do have fosters for some of our dogs for people that are qualified to foster. And I don't mean that to sound in a takeaway manner that, oh, you have to be somebody special to foster. But when, you, when you're dealing with a dog that may have a medical condition or that could be p potentially aggressive uh, in a given situation, we have to be really, really careful about fostering. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, our fosters are selected with just as much careful criteria as, as our adoption because we don't want uh, the dog or the foster to have an issue. Yeah, and if that does not address your problem, I mean, a problem, not a problem. If that doesn't address your question, uh, ask whatever it was that I didn't answer, and I'll answer it. So. <laughs> uh, and, Michelle, I wanted to know if your handlers are working strictly out of Texas. I think you covered that. You just started the new place up in the Northeast, and maybe you're going to think about California? Uh, we're currently our operation, our facility where we do all our rehab, with the, except of the new, with the exception of the new space up in the Northeast, is in our facility that's just north north of Houston. The reason is because all our veterinarians are there, all our specialists, our oncologists. Uh, we have huge support in the city of Houston, and it's our founder's home base. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Kathy wanted to know if you actually transfer dogs to different contractors. So if one contractor has a, has a dog, no, you don't transfer them? No, we only deal with dogs that are retired. We don't shuttle dogs between point A and B for different contractors. They get paid for that. They can do it. Okay. Pat's question is, is there a list of available dogs? And if so, what is the fee for adoption? Okay. First of all, uh, we've gotten away from putting up a list of available dogs simply because everybody wants that dog. And that dog may not be a fit for your family. That dog may eat your couch or your chihuahua or your cat. We want to make sure that the dog that you adopt is a dog that's the best fit for you. And when you fill out the application and you list the things that you want in a dog, you list your home environment, we look to see if you're a fit for the dogs that we have. You may be a perfect fit. You may get a call the next day. You may get a call the next month. You may get a letter that says, hey, right now we don't have a dog we can place with you. It totally depends on the ability of the dog to mess with, to, to, to mesh with your, or meld with your particular situation. Now, I will say that we're going to be putting up a, a lot of photos and, you know, the dogs are going to be up there. And certainly, if you're interested in a, in a particular dog, step up, but don't be disappointed if you're not a match for that dog. There was a dog I wanted. I really wanted him. I'm the co-founder. You know, I should be like, give me the dog. <laughs> it wouldn't have been a good idea. I've got two cats. The cats would have been dinner. No, they are cats. <laughs> yeah, I'm about kitties. I can't talk. I got a cat too. I got Jack the cat. So, 
Uh, the question about the dogs are adopted. Do you actually, can an adopter reach out to you if they just need a little help with medications and stuff like that? Uh, again, we expect the adopt the people that adopt our dogs to be able to afford the cost of care. Yeah. If you can't afford the cost of care, rethink it. And I mean no disrespect, but the last thing I want is for one of our dogs to not get medical care because a family can't afford the cost of care or would have to do without something the family needs to take care of the dog. So that's a consideration. And, and let me cover it. Let me touch on that just, just a second. If you're giving a dog the amount of veterinary care they need at nine years plus without anything going wrong, you're going to be spending about $350 to $400 a year just for various vet visits. And you need to have the dog on a joint supplement. Now, there may be some situations where we're able to provide certain things like that. And when we can, we do. But as far as the bulk of the vet care, now for our military working dogs, Red Bank Veterinary Care uh, and the United States War Dogs Association has a prescription program where you can get it for free. But if it's a contract working dog, we currently don't have that ability. However, we are working to establish something along those, excuse me, something along those lines. So that's it's not here now, but... Uh, I really would like to see it because I'd like the financial obstacle removed from an otherwise qualified family to be able to take a dog. <coughs> uh, question I hear you while you're taking a drink there is how old are he or she? How what? Oreo. Oreo. Oh, how old is Oreo? I thought you said, how old am I? I'm older than dirt. <laughs> I'm 61. Uh, Oreo is uh, 12 and a half years old and he has a very rare form of anal sac carcinoma and it, it grew rapidly and oreo nearly died a year ago uh, but what we caught it in time he's gone through chemo he's maintained his quality of life and i think some of you have seen him swimming in the pool and uh, that's something he, he loves to do in fact when i get home tonight Oreo's going to swim before i do anything else it's his thing it's awesome Okay, one last question, Deb, is if they apply to the adopter, are they notified that they're not qualified or they just they don't hear anything? Uh, again, if uh, we're revamping our procedures on this, a lot of people get upset if they don't get constant contact. However, I've got to be honest with you. We're a small crew and we've got thousands of people wanting a handful of dogs. It's difficult for us to maintain the health of the dogs, deal, deal with their boarding, deal with their transportation, uh, rehoming, reunions, and, and have somebody that just does nothing but sit and communicate with adopters. Uh, most of us have, I have a full-time job on top of this full-time job for Mission Canine Rescue. I put in about 80 hours a week. I physically don't have time personally to email each and everyone. I will say, that uh, this about that. Uh, if you are a match, we're going to respond to you quickly. If you have, if we have a dog that's a match for you, then if you want to reach out to us, if you haven't heard from us in 30 days and say, Hey, am I still in consideration? We'll always take the time and look, but sometimes some time does pass. And because of how busy we are, we really appreciate the fact that you are good with that and that you don't push us too much to respond promptly, uh, especially since there's not a lot of, uh, the, somebody asked about the rehoming fee. I believe it's $350 is what we charge. And that's just, that's a fraction of what we spend on these dogs. It costs us more than that just to have the dogs neutered or spayed when they get through working. So in all cases, we will try to communicate promptly. And that is something that we're attempting to improve as we grow and we've added staff. But again, we've been a team of three up until just five months ago. So we're, you know, we're growing. We ask that you bear with us while still continuing to support us. Now, how's that for being politically correct? That's awesome. Okay, I'll roll this up with the last question. Multiple people have asked this, and I've seen it asked before in, in other uh, venues, is how can we help beyond just giving money? Like, I want to give you my time. I want to come work at the kennels. I want to foster a dog. How, do, how can people do that? Okay, we're we're working on that, and, and quite candidly, uh, the the main thing people can do right now is support us financially. And and I hate to have to be that direct, but not everybody can do 
what we do. Uh, we will accept volunteers at the ranch. Uh, at some point, we're going to have uh, a couple of trailers as quarters for retired veterans that want to come down and work with the dog. So we've got one vet that comes down and works with the dog all weeks. And, and you should see the the load it takes off of him just getting to interact with, with the dogs. This is a gentleman that had some some pretty bad PTSD problems. And uh, it just it's wonderful to see the effect the dogs have. Uh, we're always up for people to volunteer to help us out at events or organizations. But again, it involves us educating you about what we do and how we do it. And, and we can't have anyone telling a story somewhere that's not 100% correct. And that's, that's why we hold a lot of things tight. We do it all in, individually. But as far as volunteer opportunities, uh, there will be some things coming up that can be done. It, no, it's not at all ways about money, but without money, the work doesn't get done. And our, our dream is to find a couple of corporate sponsors that have large budgets that value what we do for veterans and for animals that have served this country and step up in a larger way to where we don't have to ask our audience as fans for as much. That's, that's my dream. It really, really is. And that's my goal too, and hopefully we can uh, we can achieve that. I think it'll be awesome. Yeah, folks. Clint is a big part of this. Clint runs uh, uh, as part of uh, Google's grants to nonprofits. We have a twenty thousand dollar a month grant to use Google AdWords. Now, it you know, those are the sponsored ads that you see when you search on Google, and we can only bid two dollars per click. So it keeps us out of a lot of the bigger terms that would get us more exposure. But Clint's work has uh, given us uh, the ability to have a lot more people reach our website. Our website's got a great new look because of him. And my hat's off and show my bald head to everybody and say thank you. I leave my hat on because I don't want people talking about my male pattern baldness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there you go. I just shave it. So go <laughs> Well, Bob, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time. I appreciate it. I know you guys are busy with uh, everything that's going on. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I appreciate it. I hope you learned a lot about Mission Canine. I hope you were, you know, see it in your hearts. If, you know, it doesn't take much, a dollar here, a dollar there, uh, it'll all make a difference. And if anything, just give Mission Canine a shout out to your friends on, on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're at and kind of build awareness of this great program and what they're doing every day. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.